Pleasure to welcome everyone tonight to a special session. Tonight's topic is the information paradox. We have the honor of having two very prominent physicists with us. Professor Lenny Suskind is not only a leading physicist known throughout the world, but he's also one of the primary interlocutors in this debate that's gone on for more than 40 years. And it's a real pleasure to have Lenny here tonight to share with us his experience uh, of this really very interesting discussion and argument to some extent over many years and where it has led us in physics. He'll be joined tonight by Adam Brown, his longtime collaborator. And both Lenny and Adam are here at Google at least part of the time. Lenny visiting faculty and Adam full-time now, a research scientist here with us at Google. Uh, tonight's going to be very illuminating, but I do encourage people to get more information by getting a copy of Lenny's book, The Black Hole War. Uh, it's actually a fascinating read. And whether or not uh, you want to get deeper into physics, this is actually a great way to understand the topic at hand. So with that, let's welcome Professor Lenny Suskind. Lenny. What I like doing best in front of an audience is explaining something, explaining something simple in the simple possible, simplest possible way. Even better. I like to explain something really hard and complicated in a really simple way. I think there's a certain amount of ego in doing that. You know, you get to say, look how smart I am. But uh, really, it's pretty much the way I think. Well, everything I ever learned about physics, I learned by teaching it or by explaining it. And so I always take as much opportunity as I can to explain things, partly because I learned from it. Uh, so I'm going to do one or two simple things about black holes, and then Adam will take over and give you the grand overview. Where's Adam? You will, will you not? Good. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Time. What about time? Time is important. We have some time, but, um, you know, it's very interesting. Different cultures perceive time in different ways. There are some cultures in which people think of time as being up in front of them, or the future as being in front of you. You face the future, right? Or you don't face the future if you're uh, not up to it. There are other cultures where I think it makes more sense, where the, where the future is behind you, and you're looking at the past. Why is that? Well, you can see the past. You can't see the future. So the future must be behind you where you can see it. In the scientific world, there are also different cultures. I, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, in the computer science culture, past, let's see, if I'm facing this way, past is over there and future is up there. People draw circuits, quantum circuits, or the evolution of a, of a, of a computer is going from left to right. In physics, for reasons I have no idea why, physics, physics always has time going upward. That's a convention. I'm not sure how far back it goes, but I think it goes back to Minkowski. Minkowski was the first one to think of the world in terms of space-time, not Einstein. Einstein was before Minkowski. Uh, two years before Minkowski, Einstein invented the special theory of relativity. But much of the way we think about space-time came from Hermann Minkowski, who had this image of space and time as space-time. There it is. There's space-time. Uh, the lines in it are just mathematical lines that we draw in order to orient ourselves. Think of time as up, space horizontal. Many of you have seen these kind of pictures before. And what are the diagonal lines? Let's for the moment suppose that somebody has gotten right to the center of this diagram. They didn't just pop there. They got there by traveling to there from the past, but at some time they just are at the center of this diagram. Then they can do two things. They have a flat, they have a laser, flashlight. They can flashlight the, the, the light to the left or they can flash it to the right. How does light move? Light moves along these 45 degree lines. 45 degrees because we've conventionally set the speed of light to one. So you move as far as you have time to go. And those two lines are called the light cone, one to the left, one to the right, and they are the trajectories of light rays. Now, what Einstein said, this is what Minkowski said, it's probably one of the most important observations in physics, just drawing this diagram. 
Um, Einstein, a little later yet, later than this, was starting to think about gravity. The special theory of relativity really had to do with electricity and magnetism. Later came gravity, and the key insight of Einstein's, I think it was about 1907, was that gravity is the same as acceleration. You all know this, if you've been in an elevator accelerating upward, you know that you feel a sense of pushing on your feet, just like the floor does. So gravity and acceleration are sort of the same thing. And what Einstein said is if you want to understand gravity, first think about what life would be like in an accelerating elevator, in a uniformly accelerating elevator. Now, the idea of acceleration, uniform acceleration, in the special theory of relativity is a little bit different than it is in pre-relativistic physics. If you're uniformly accelerating in pre-relativistic -acceler pre physics, you'll just accelerate more and more and more. Your velocity will increase and increase and increase. But in relativity, you can't accelerate faster than the speed of light. And so the blue lines are the imaginary trajectories of people who are uniformly accelerated. They can't get past the black line because the black line is moving with the speed of light. And so they move on those hyperbolic trajectories, one next to the next, next to the next, each accelerating off along these hyperbolic trajectories. And um, if you can understand physics as seen by those observers, you learn something about life in an accelerated world. And according to Einstein, you've learned something about what gravitation is like. Let's imagine an observer, let's call him an observer, moving along one of these hyperbolas. And somebody at this point over here throws in an object, throws an object toward the center. That object moves along a straight line, for example. And it moves and it will eventually cross the black light cone. Let's think about that for a moment. How does somebody who is moving uh, along these blue trajectories, how do they see the red particle falling in? The answer is they never see the red particle falling in. Uh, the person along here, well, let's, let's follow this one. How does he see, he looks back, he can't look straight across. He has to look at a light signal coming at him. He looks, and later and later and later, he looks back. And what does he see? He sees the particle that's falling in asymptotically approach this light cone here, never quite seeing it go past there. That's a little bit strange, isn't it? I mean, uh, an ordinary observer moving with an accelerated velocity, watching a particle fall, never sees the particle fall past, let's call it the horizon now. Why the horizon? Because he never sees it cross there. In fact, what he sees is a little more complicated than that. He sees the object, whatever it is. It could be an elementary particle. It could be a basketball. He sees it move toward the horizon slower and slower and slower. Why slower and slower? Because it just takes an infinite amount of time for him to get there. And at the same time, he sees it Lorentz contract, relativity. He sees the object get more and more pancaked, more and more squashed. If we were to draw, oh, here we are. If we were to draw a picture of somebody falling into a black hole, now we're coming to black holes. But the point is we've learned something by thinking about acceleration. With thinking about acceleration, we've learned that an object never quite gets past a thing that we can call the horizon. It pancakes, it slows down, and the same thing is true, exactly the same thing is true of an object, whoops, of an object falling toward the horizon of a black hole. As it falls in, it pancakes, gets contracted, and asymptotically it takes longer and longer and longer for it to get to the horizon. Again, we learned it by thinking about acceleration, but we now apply acceleration and that's the way the black hole works. On the other hand, what about somebody who is following the trajectory of this infalling object? They don't see anything peculiar. They don't see the thing slow down. Why not? Well, I watch the thing. I'm falling with it. My heart is slowing down. My watch is slowing down, at least 
from the outside. The particle is getting closer and closer. My clocks are slowing down. Its clocks are slowing down. I can't tell at all that anything peculiar is happening. And it's not from my point of view. And so what do I see as I am falling in with the object? I see it go right past the horizon and fall into the black hole. That is the same thing as traveling along with that red particle and watching it fall past the light cone. Okay, so that's a little bit, it's a little peculiar. It's a funny tension in two descriptions of the world. In one description of the world, as seen from outside, nothing ever gets past the horizon. On the other hand, from the other description, somebody falling in with it, there's no obstruction to getting past the horizon. It just takes a finite amount of time. You're outside, then you're inside. And um, we understand that. This was never considered a source of great tension in physics, that the two, ob the two descriptions are so different. It was thought of as a curiosity, but it's more than a curiosity. It is, what we've learned is the relative, is a relativity of descriptions. Descriptions of things can be very, very different, even though they're describing exactly the same thing. Okay, so I wanted to bring that up. Uh, Adam, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. But this is the source of the great controversy, though. This is part of the source of the great controversy that's kind of uh, occupied physics for pretty much most of 40 years now. Now, I want to go on to something else. So I just brought this up for your attention. I want to go on to something else which is quite different. Again, it has to do with black holes. But what I want to explain to you is why black holes have entropy and why they have temperature. I'm sure we'll come back to this. And if not, you can ask me about it. Okay, what is entropy? First of all, what is entropy? Entropy is hidden information. Some of you are computer scientists. All of you use computers. You know that in your computer, there is storage of information. It's stored in bits. In a quantum computer, it's stored in qubits. Uh, we don't have to, I, I don't need to give you a formal definition of what information is. But let me say that what entropy is, is it's hidden information. Hidden information, for example, if I have a box and I put a number of qubits into the box, I seal the box, I ask what are bits, bits or qubits, it doesn't matter. I put a number of them in the box. They're hidden in the box. I can't get into the box because I don't have the key. I then say that that box has stored hidden information and the amount of hidden information we call the entropy of the box. Now, sometimes information is hidden because it's stuck in a box, but sometimes it's hidden because it's in the form of degrees of freedom of objects which are just too small to see, too, too numerous to keep track of. A bathtub full of hot water has a huge amount of information in it, the position and velocity of every, every molecule, but we can't keep track of it. It's just impossible to keep track of it, so it's hidden. That hidden information is called entropy, and entropy is the quantity of hidden information. Okay, so why do black holes have entropy? Well, first of all, it's kind of obvious. They have entropy because stuff falls into them or falls onto the surface of them if you're watching from the outside, getting closer and closer to the surface, getting pancaked. Well, we can't see that stuff. It's gotten too close to the horizon. From another point of view, the point of view of the person falling into the black hole, that information falls into the black hole, but it's hidden. It's hidden from the outside. So the outside person says that there is entropy. Now, how much entropy can a black hole store? The answer in classical physics is an interesting point. Um, the first person who realized that black holes had entropy was Bekenstein, physicist, uh, Israeli physicist who realized that black holes have entropy. It wasn't that he realized that black holes have entropy. It was obvious, although nobody said it, that black holes have loads of entropy. In fact, the amount of entropy that a classical black hole, before quantum mechanics comes, how much entropy can a black hole store? An infinite amount. You can put very, very um, minute bits of information 
stored in arbitrarily small amounts of energy, in arbitrarily small amounts of volume. You can drop it into the black hole in classical physics. And uh, you can store any amount of information in a classical black hole according to classical physics. So the right statement before Bekenstein was not, should not have been that black holes don't have entropy. It should have been that black holes can have infinite entropy. Have stuck, shove as much stuff into them as you want without putting any additional or putting negligible amount of energy into them. Um, that's what we're going to talk about now. Why black holes, not why they have entropy, but why they have finite entropy. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, classically, black LOS is a symbol that's always used for entropy. I do not know where it came from. Adam, do you know where S equals entropy came from? No, I don't know. For Carnot? Clausius. Who? Clausius. Clausius. And why did he call it S? Oh, okay, I don't either. But S is entropy. All right, in classical physics, the entropy of a black hole is infinite. Now I want to come to why black holes have finite entropy. And here's the way I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it by starting with a very tiny black hole. Where did that black hole come from? Don't worry about it. We, we start with a very tiny one. It could be a you know, negligible size. And now we're going to build up our black hole until it's of whatever size black hole we're interested in. How are we going to build it up? We're going to build it up by dropping in bit by bit by bit information. What is the smallest amount of information that you can drop into a black hole? How, and how do you drop it in? The answer is basically one elementary particle, a photon, dropped into a black hole adds to its entropy or adds to the amount of stored information one bit. But that's not quite right. Imagine I have the horizon of a black hole. Let's see if we have. Okay, I don't, I don't have a good picture of it. Black hole is a big sphere. The horizon of the black hole is a big sphere. And now imagine I have a laser, and I, I use a laser to drop in a number of photons. How much information does every photon convey? Well, it conveys a lot more than just one bit. Why? For example, it conveys all of the information about what direction it was coming in from, or where it arrived on the horizon, from the left, from the right, from up, from down. In fact, there are many, many decimal points, uh, many, many decimals that you could um, describe the direction of the, uh, of the incoming photon in terms of. So typically, a photon dropped into a black hole will carry more than one bit. How can we make sure that the photon only carries one bit? And here's the trick. You would like to drop the photon in in a way that all you can tell is either it got in or it didn't get in. You can't tell where it got in from the horizon. That's all you can tell. It's either got in or not got in. The way to do that is to make the uncertainty in the position of the photon bigger than the black hole. And that's quantum mechanics, or as big as the black hole. Now, it turns out that if you try to make the uncertainty, how do you do that? You make the wavelength of the photon as big as the size of the black hole. If you make the wavelength of the photon as big as the black hole, then, then you know, looking at the black hole, looking at an object with long wavelength radiation, all you see is a blur. Same thing with a black hole here. If you drop a photon in of long wavelength, all you can tell is either that it got in or it didn't get in. Now, it turns out that if you try to drop in light of longer wavelength than the black hole size, it'll just reflect off the black hole. It won't go in. True. Take it from me. Trust me. Trust me. It's true. Uh, so, on the other hand, if you drop in light of smaller wavelength, it carries more information than that single bit. So, what's the trick? The trick is to drop in the light at just the wavelength of the size of the black hole. Good, okay, so keep that in mind. And we're gonna drop in photon by photon and photon, building up the size of the black hole by adding the energy. We're gonna add energy, photon by photon, build up the black hole, and then when it's gonna build up, when it's built up, we're gonna ask how many photons did we have to drop in to build it up to a certain size. That will be its entropy. That will be the number of hidden bits of information. 
Okay, so what do you need to know about black holes? I originally claimed uh, when I first gave this lecture that I'm going to explain it to you without any calculus, not even calculus. If you watch carefully, you'll notice that there's some place where I use calculus. When I do that, jump out of your seat and say, hey, you're using calculus. Okay, so, but, uh, all right, what do you need to know? You first of all need to know the radius of the horizon of a black hole. It's called the Schwarzschild radius. And for a standard black hole, the Schwarzschild radius is twice the mass of the black hole, m, times the Newton constant, Newton's gravitational constant, divided by the speed of light squared. Incidentally, the Newton's constant is a rather small number, and some standard units 10 to the minus 11. Speed of light is a large number, and so the radius of the black hole is very small by uh, comparison with any other object of a given mass. Now, we're going to drop in a photon. How much energy do we get when we drop in a photon of wavelength lambda? Lambda is a standard notation for a wavelength. How much energy do we get? Well, that's quantum mechanics. So I go back to quantum mechanics. There's a symbol called h-bar. That's a number, Planck's constant. The speed of light divided by the wavelength. You can check that this has units of energy, and that's the amount of energy that uh, that one photon of wavelength lambda has. This has nothing to do with black holes. This is very standard. That's how much energy you put in h bar c, and now we're setting lambda equal to the radius of the black hole itself. So it's h bar c divided by r. Next, how much mass does that give the black hole? Well, all we do is use e equals mc squared. If we drop in a certain energy, we divide it by c squared to find the change in mass of the object. So we divide this formula by c squared. That puts the c in the denominator. And it tells us the change in mass of the black hole is h bar over rc. And next step, we go back to this formula. We change the mass by this much. That tells us how much the radius changes. And here it is. The change in r is h bar g. The g comes from here, divided by r times c cubed. You can just trace that through, and you'll find it. And that's what you find. The change in the radius of the black hole is h bar g over uh, c cubed. Now that's kind of interesting. Let me multiply that formula by r. I've taken the r in the denominator and put it up over here. Here it is. r times a change in r is a number. That number doesn't depend on anything except the constants h bar g and c. So the change of r times r is h bar g divided by c cubed. Now I maintain that r times the change in r is the change in r squared. Calculus, calculus, never did it. That's the only calculus I've used. r delta r is one half the change in r squared. And r squared is proportional to the area of the horizon. The horizon is 4 pi r squared. So the left-hand side is proportional to the change in the area, and the right-hand side is just a number. It doesn't matter how big the black hole is. Every time you drop in one bit of information, you change the area by exactly that much. r, delta r, or the same thing, the change in the area is this universal constant. Now, this universal constant has units of area, and it's called the Planck area. It's the square of the Planck length, and it's about 10 to the 66 square centimeters. It's really small, uh, 10 to the 66. So what it's telling you is every time you drop in a bit of information, it changes the area of the black hole by 10 to the minus 66 square centimeters, the Planck unit. Well, you can turn that around, and you can say, how many units like that do I have to put in to make a black hole of area A? That's the entropy. That's the number of hidden pieces of information you put in. And that's proportional to the area divided by the same universal constant. You divide it by that, so the C cube goes upstairs, the H bar goes downstairs, and the G goes downstairs. 
That is a famous formula. That formula is Bekenstein's formula. Uh, Bekenstein, all, everything we're doing now has been sort of a little bit fuzzy. It's a little bit fuzzy because when I, most of the equations I wrote down were sort of proportionalities. They're true, I left out pies, I left out uh, twos. I didn't really know exactly what the longest wavelength, or what the longest wavelength photon I can get into a black hole is. So I was a little bit sketchy there in terms of the coefficients, yeah. Obviously, the world is two-dimensional. What's that? Obviously, two-dimensional world. Two-dimensional? Three. So, uh, this was a three-dimensional world. I'm sorry, I couldn't draw it as three-dimensional. No. All right, this is, a, this is a world of three dimensions. It would be different than four dimensions, five dimensions, six dimensions, but uh, very similar, very similar but different. The numerical coefficients Bekenstein could not figure out. The person who figured out the numerical coefficient with precision was Hawking. I won't go into that. Uh, that, uh, that takes a more complicated uh, calculation. But this was the basic calculation that stemmed from around the time of 1975, 73, 74, 75, the calculation that uh, black holes have entropy, but that the entropy is finite. Oh, here's an interesting point. Notice where the h-bar goes. H-bar is a small number. It characterizes quantum units, quantum mechanics. If quantum mechanics were to be replaced by classical physics, it's the same as saying h-bar is equal to zero. So the classical world is the world of h-bar going to zero. And if you look at this formula, you see, indeed, as h-bar gets smaller and smaller, what happens is the entropy gets larger and larger. I know the relationship with Planck scale. How was Planck scale turning initially, not? Uh, initially? Yeah. <laughs> it goes back to Planck. It goes back to Planck. Uh, Planck knew about the speed of light. Okay, I'll take a couple of minutes and, and, and answer that question. Um, there are three basic units in physics, mass, length, and time. Everybody will agree, mass, length, and time are the basic units. There are also three basic constants in physics. And when I say they're basic, let me call them universal constants. The speed of light. Why, in what sense is the speed of light um, basic? It's basic in the sense that here's what it is. It's the fastest possible speed that any object can go. All right? Once you say that any object can go, you're talking about something universal. It's not a feature of photons. It's not a feature. It's a feature of anything. No object can move faster than the speed of light. It's a universal constant. All right? It's not like the speed of sound in this room. That changes from room to room. Every pair of objects in the universe interact with a gravitational force that's controlled by Newton's constant. So again, Newton's constant was a very basic constant. Planck discovered yet another constant. His constant, h-bar. Was it universal? Was it something that everything in the world has to, um, is controlled by? Well, I don't know if Planck knew it. I think he suspected it. I think he did suspect it. But it was Heisenberg who said, for any object, the product of the uncertainty in position and the uncertainty in momentum is always greater than or equal to h-bar, h-bar over 2 to be exact. Again, an element of universality, not for protons, not for, uh, for people, but for anything. So those are three basic constants. Planck asked the question, out of those three basic constants, can we construct units of length, mass, and time. And yes, if you have the three constants, you can assemble them together and construct units of space. So uh, this c cubed over h bar g, if you take the square root of it, is the basic unit of length that Planck discovered. So it was, it was dimensional analysis. He had these three constants, and he said, can I make a set of units out of them? Maybe those units are important in some way. He didn't know in what way. Remember, this was... Before the invention of quantum mechanics, certainly it was another 25 years or another 26 years be before quantum mechanics as we know it existed. It was before the invention of the general theory of relativity. So he was just guessing that these things might be important. Does that answer your question? Uh, partly. I mean, I'm still curious how it came up with the specific value. 
Oh, he just put the constants together until he got a link. Dimensional analysis. Hmm? It was oh, absolutely empirical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely empirical. Yes, uh, and may have been one of the first important. Ten. Okay. Well, I'm almost finished. Don't worry about it. All right. So that's uh, that's where those units came from. Now, an object like a black hole has energy, namely its mass, or its mass divided E equals mc squared, E equals, yeah, take the mass and multiply it by c squared, that's its energy. We say it also has entropy. If it has entropy and mass, it has something else. Anybody know what that something else is? Temperature. Temperature. Okay, so... This formula over here is the called the first law of thermodynamics. What it says is that whenever you change the entropy of a system, you also change the energy. For example, supposing you do change the entropy by one unit, one basic bit. So let's say delta S equal to one. The energy necessary to change the entropy by one unit is called the temperature. That's the definition of temperature. You're probably not terribly familiar with that, but it is the fundamental definition of the temperature of an object. How much energy does it take to add one bit of hidden information to it? That's thermodynamics. It's not quantum mechanics. It's not relativity. It's just basic thermodynamics. All right, so if I say every time I drop in a photon, that's one bit, and it changes the energy. Here's the formula for the change in energy, h bar c over r. Then this h bar c over r must be the temperature. Basic thermodynamic argument. Uh, any person who knew thermodynamics could have made it. Bekenstein himself did not make it. I don't think he knew that the black hole had temperature. Again, it was Hawking. The temperature of a black hole is h bar c over r. Well, if an object has temperature, it means that it radiates. An object that has temperature is a black body. A black body is just a thing which has temperature, but because it has temperature, it emits photons. Any object with a given temperature will radiate at a certain rate controlled by the temperature. If it radiates, or this was something new, it was always thought that black holes were really black, meaning to say that they, nothing was given off by them. But what this told Hawking, actually the truth is Hawking didn't believe it at first, but he came to believe it, that if the black hole has entropy and energy, then according to this formula, it must have a temperature. And if it has a temperature, it must radiate. If it radiates like anything else, it will lose energy. If it loses energy, it means it loses mass. And so eventually, the black hole will radiate away. When the black hole radiates away, it will just disappear. Like a, roughly like a droplet of water uh, just radiating its energy away, either in the form of uh, molecules of water or even uh, other forms. Let's say molecules of water. It will eventually just disappear when all of its energy is gone. This led to the big puzzle. What happens to the stuff that fell into the black hole, all of this hidden information, what happened to it when the black hole evaporates? Nothing can get out of a black hole, so it can't get out. Maybe it just disappears. Maybe it just disappears from the world, the bits that fell into the black hole. Ah, but that's not consistent with the laws of physics. The most fundamental law of physics is that information never disappears. It really is built deeply into classical mechanics. It's called the Liouville theorem. And it's really even more deeply built into quantum mechanics. It's called unitarity. Those are just the words for it. But what it says is that information may get lost in a practical sense. It may get lost in a practical sense because it gets all scrambled up and too hard to see, too hard to retrieve. But that's a technical problem. Information itself must never be lost. And here we now have the situation, the black hole evaporates. Before the black hole evaporated, 
You could just say, oh, it's there, it's in the black hole, or there, it's uh, there on the surface of the black hole. But once the black hole completely evaporated, now you have to answer the question, did information really disappear? Is this something new? Do black holes create a new, do they um, catalyze a new thing that was previously unknown, namely that information can disappear from the world? Or is there some secret way that the information is there in the radiation that gets radiated away, but uh, that's too hard to, to pull apart from different photons. The argument against saying that the information is there in the radiation is that nothing can get out of a black hole without exceeding the speed of light, and so it could not have gotten out of a black hole. That was the big dilemma uh, that Hawking enunciated, that Hawking uh, created. It was the big dilemma. I think he gave the wrong answer, but it was an extremely deep insight. And uh, with that, I will leave it for Adam to, uh, to fill in the details. Adam. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm going to tell you about uh, is trying to answer the question, uh, does information escape from black holes? So this is the uh, what Lenny just finished with. Um, after Bekenstein and Hawking had discovered that black holes have entropy and therefore eventually evaporate, uh, that raised a question that Hawking raised almost immediately, in fact, after this had been, been uh, the temperature of the black hole had been realized, which is when the black hole eventually disappears, the black hole slowly gives out all its energy. When it eventually disappears, what happens to the information that fell into the black hole, that constituted the black hole? Does that information make it out? Is that spewed back into the universe along with the energy? Or is it destroyed? Um, um, and this has been one of the great motivating thought experiments over the last half century. Um, and Lenny has played a big part in this, uh, this the development of this thought experiment, of the, the implications of it. And what I'm going to do now is just give you some understanding of why there's a problem, what Hawking's argument was, what there's, that there should be a problem, um, and, then, and then maybe hint at a little, a few things beyond that. OK, so uh, does information escape from black holes? What is a black hole? You know what a black hole is. I just told you it's a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity, our best theory of gravity, um, objects so massive uh, and heavy and compact that nothing, not even light, can escape. Uh, and of course, over the last few years, the most exciting observational things that have happened have been we have both seen them in the Event Horizon Telescope, and we have heard them, or at least we, what we've seen is the accretion disks that surround them, not the black hole itself, because those are black, with the exception of the Hawking radiation that's far too faint to see. And we've also heard them with gravity waves. OK, so the, here is my little picture of a black hole. Um, and uh, this is all, this, the sophistication of this picture is going to be everything that we're going to need and everything Hawking needed to run his argument. Uh, and there are two bits in this picture. There's the red dot in the center, and there is the blue circle that surrounds it. And the fact that there's two things uh, encodes for us the crucial distinction that will be played by between being dead and merely being doomed. Um, and, and that's really going to be the crucial distinction for us. Uh, so um, the blue is called the event horizon. That is where you are doomed. The singularity is uh, at the center. And that, by the time you get there, you are most definitely dead. Um, and so here is a, a stick figure ready to be thrown into the black hole. Um, and uh, in this animation, as they pass the event horizon of the black hole, they are at that stage doomed. However, they may not be uh, dead. Um, by contrast, uh, once they reach the singularity, uh, then they are definitely dead. Uh, they have been scrunched to a geometrical point um, uh, and generally had an unhealthy time. Um, and indeed, as they approach the singularity, as they cl get closer and closer to the singularity, uh, life gets more and more unpleasant. The 
uh, tidal forces start ripping them apart. The gravitational field at their head is very different from the gravitational field at their feet. Uh, life gets increasingly unpleasant. Um, uh, but uh, they are sort of guaranteed to be dead by the time they hit the singularity. But crucially, um, for a large enough black hole, there is, can be nothing wrong whatsoever with the experience of somebody who is passing through the event horizon. Um, uh, right. Um, so the distance between the singularity and the event horizon is determined by the mass of the black hole. So if you have a black hole that weighs the same as the sun, a solar mass black hole, that mass is about, that distance is about one mile between the singularity and the event horizon. Um, which if you're moving it close to the speed of light, and you will indeed be moving it very close to the speed of light, by the time you get close to it, it uh, doesn't take very long at all. However, if you have a much bigger black hole, the, a much more massive black hole, the size of the black hole, the distance from the singularity to the event horizon, scales linearly with the mass. So the black hole at the center of our galaxy is a million times the mass of the sun. Therefore, it is a million miles between the singularity of that black hole, this, where it, this crunching point at the center, where all of the mass accumulates, and the event horizon, the, the point of no return, the point at which you'd have to move faster than the speed of light to escape. The black hole at the center of uh, Andromeda is in fact a billion times the mass of the sun, and therefore has a billion mile uh, event horizon. Um, and if you took a uh, black hole that was uh, a million times bigger again, let us say, then you could very happily uh, live out your entire life between crossing the event horizon, even moving at the speed of light or close to the speed of light before you hit the singularity of the black hole. Um, and indeed, uh, the tidal forces that are gonna make life unpleasant get very strong close to the singularity eventually becoming uh, formally infinite as you approach the singularity. But uh, as you past the event horizon, uh, for very large black holes, the tidal forces are very small, and life is very uh, is not unpleasant. If you, in fact, if you cross the event horizon, um, you would find that there would be no uh, sign to you whatsoever that uh, you have passed the point of no return, that to get out, you would have to uh, fire your rockets infinitely fast. Uh, you just glide across completely oblivious. Um, now, the singularity, of course, is where are, uh, is where gravity gets very strong. You don't know what's, uh, what's happening there. Maybe we need string theory to describe, uh, have any attempt to describe what's going on at the singularity. Quantum gravity gets extremely uh, pronounced near the singularity. But um, it seems as though nothing strange is happening at the event horizon. There's a teleologically strange thing that's happening, which is that's the point at which you better have uh, fired your retro rockets. Otherwise, you're not getting out. Uh, but in terms of just the uh, the local geometry, uh, there isn't any uh, anything strange that happens uh, at the event horizon. You just you just pass on through unimpeded, and therefore we think it is well understood. Okay, so um, the question is going to be when this thing evaporates uh, with those preliminaries about uh, classical black holes. The question is going to be: uh, Does the information make it out? And maybe I should uh, before explaining why there is a black hole information paradox, explain why there isn't an information paradox uh, if instead of burning up uh, your black hole, you burn a book, let's say. Um, so the question is, is, does the information get destroyed when you burn a book? And uh, in common parlance, I think the answer would be yes. That's indeed often the point of people burning books is to destroy the information that they contain. But a physicist would say that no, at a microscopic level, the information in the book, when you burn it, for, so for what we mean by information uh, conservation, information escape, the information is not destroyed. Uh, you burn the book and you turn all, all the pages of the book into a stream of outgoing photons that have subtle correlations between them. Uh, what that means is you've taken the information, you've scrambled it up so that it's very hard to recover. But according to our best theories of the universe, according to quantum mechanics, you have not destroyed the information. The information is still encoded in the photons. And if you were a super futuristic civilization that was technologically capable of gathering all the photons and performing some uh, extremely complicated 
quantum operation on them and quantum measurement on them, you could discover the uh, quantum information that constituted the book uh, before you burnt it. So books, uh, there is, uh, according to our definition of what it means for information to be conserved, uh, burning books, and in fact, anything non-gravitational you could ever do, cannot destroy information. Uh, as Lenny remarked, it is built into the uh, sort of core of quantum mechanics that information can neither be created nor destroyed, that it is conserved by all processes. And that's why when we come and apply the same arguments to black holes, uh, the stakes are going to be so high. Um, okay, so uh, that's if you take your encyclopedia and you burn it. We think that information is uh, preserved, so that you do not destroy the information that it is. A sufficiently advanced civilization could reconstitute the information that was contained in the encyclopedia. What if we intake the encyclopedia and throw it into the black hole? So this is going to be the crucial thought experiment that's going to establish that there's a problem. So you take the encyclopedia, you throw it into the black hole, and such is your love of learning that you jump in after the encyclopedia and read it uh, as you fall down towards the singularity. Now, if you're smart, the black hole you will select to throw the encyclopedia into will be a very large black hole. Let's say a black hole whose, uh, whose Schwarzschild radius, whose, whose distance from the singularity to the event horizon is more than 100 light years. If it's more than 100 light years, then you're going to have a very gentle ride in deep. You can live out your natural life reading the encyclopedia all the way down, uh, confirming that indeed the information contained in the encyclopedia is uh, through the event horizon. Um, as you pass the event horizon while reading your encyclopedia, nothing particularly strange will happen to you. You will maybe have a uh, strange sense of foreboding, uh, but there will be no other sign from the universe that you have passed the point of no return. Uh, you will be doomed, but you will not be dead, and you will spend the rest of your life uh, reading the encyclopedia, um, and uh, sometime before you hit the singularity, uh, you will uh, perhaps finish the encyclopedia, uh, and that will be that. Okay, so um, you have confirmed that the, the black hole, that the encyclopedia did indeed uh, cross the event horizon and continue on to, uh, towards the singularity. And as I've remarked, the event horizon is the point of no return. Once you have passed the event horizon, you can't get out again, not even if you can move at the speed of light. If you take a flashlight and, and shine it behind you, even that won't make it out. In fact, there's a sort of further statement that since you can't move fast, if you cannot move faster than the speed of light, uh, you can't move to larger radius at all. Once you've passed the event horizon, uh, you can't move out in this diagram whatsoever. You are inevitably sucked in towards the singularity. In fact, even if you move at the speed of light out, your distance from the singularity uh, shrinks uh, with time. Yeah. Isn't that an observable effect of crossing the event horizon when two people are sitting next to each other? At some point, they can no longer speak because one of them is upstream. Um, so what would happen is that uh, this one can still send a message to that one because they send a message and this one falls in uh, to collect it. The question of, yes, so that there is something at the event horizon that happens, which is this teleological effect that you're definitely going to hit the black hole. But you can't, there's no local measurable observable that, that tells you your uh, t equals infinity fate, your long-term fate. Um, it, none of the curvatures, in, the, none of the curvatures are getting large here, even what it, the distant stars look like to you as you drift across the horizon looks uh, uh, is unchanging. If I fall in just ahead of you, yeah, close but just ahead, yeah, uh, can we continue to talk to each other? At... Uh, yes, we will be able to continue to talk to each other depending on how how we fire our rockets. But uh, well, without, tip, firing tip, our rockets. without firing our rockets, we would continue to have a conversation uh, all the way down. And you can, you can talk to me, and I can talk to you. We can talk to each other, yes, up, up, up to a certain point. Um, because uh, even though I'm heading towards the singularity, uh, inevitably, I'm not moving at the speed of light. So if you sign a laser beam towards me, it can, it can up to a certain point, but, catch up with me. So isn't there a, a, a point where somebody who's just outside the event horizon and somebody who's just inside, somebody's going to make it and somebody isn't? Uh, yes, if, if the person who is out here decides to stay out, then while they can continue to send messages to the infaller, the infaller can never send messages back. That is for sure. However, the decision of the person who stays outside to remain outside 
is they have to know where the event horizon is to know where to fire their retro rockets at the appropriate juncture. OK, so um, this is really all Hawking required uh, in order to, um, uh, to establish that there is a problem. Um, uh, as we said, that's, that's far for a large enough black hole. That could be 100 light years. Um, and uh, Hawking in 1974, as we just learned, decided that black holes evaporate eventually. All of these uh, experiments we're describing are very theoretical, because first of all, you need to be able to gather all of the radiation from the black hole to decide whether the information has, has made it out. And secondly, you need to wait for your black hole to evaporate. And black holes that have, instead of solar mass black hole takes 10 to the 55 times the current age of the universe to evaporate. A black hole that's 100 light years across is, uh, takes correspondingly longer. Um, but if you could do it, um, then Hawking says, because there's a temperature, eventually the black hole will evaporate, eventually it will be gone, and you can ask the question, what happened to the information that fell into it? Um, does it evaporate unitarily, we say? So the different ways to say the information is conserved, is information preserved, is the evaporation unitary? You can ask, ask all of those questions. Um, all the information, uh, at least given the story I told you, resides in the encyclopedia uh, as you uh, li live out your life reading the encyclopedia and sailing on down to the singularity. Um, but Hawking's calculation showed that the Hawking radiation, the energy that is emitted from the black hole, is not emitted from the singularity. Um, it's not emitted from the singularity, partly because just that's what Hawking's calculation shows. But secondly, even if there was some radiation that was emitted from the singularity, because the radiation can't go faster than the speed of light, it would just fall back into the singularity again. Does you no good. All of the Hawking radiation, according to Hawking's formula, is emitted from the horizon. All of this Hawking radiation, by the time the black hole has finished evaporating, the only thing that will be left of the black hole will be all this, uh, according to Hawking's calculation, will be all of this Hawking radiation streaming off into the night sky. Does that Hawking radiation, it must somehow encode the information that made it into the singularity at the center. But there is a problem, which is that the encyclopedia ends up at the singularity. The Hawking radiation is emitted from the event horizon, which as we established is, can be 100 light years away from the singularity. And the question is, how did the information, if it escaped, how did the information escape, given that it would have to uh, tunnel faster than the speed of light, 100 light years from the singularity out to the, radiation, out to the event horizon in order to be emitted? So that is why Hawking says information must be destroyed during the evaporation of a black hole. That's what his paper says. And uh, this has really been one of the this is a big problem and has uh, the, as Lenny said, I think it's ultimately incorrect. I think in information does indeed escape from a black hole, but uh, answering and explicating how it escapes from a black hole and what exactly is wrong with this argument has been an extremely productive line of thought right from the word go. Um, many of uh, Lenny's most famous ideas were developed to try and uh, re rebut or at least address questions raised by this argument. And it continues to be a very active area of research uh, up till today. So even in the last few months, there have been sort of exciting new developments uh, as people have like figured out another little pieces of the puzzle of quite how the information escapes. Uh, and with that, I will. Um, Let me just interject one thing. Yeah. I said earlier that there was this tension between the two ways of seeing the black hole. Yeah. From the point of view of outside, nothing ever falls into a black hole. So from the point of view of outside, it's not a puzzle. It never got into the black hole. It's only from the point of view of somebody who's riding in that uh, they experience the objects as falling in. But it's this tension between these two pictures. Well, from one picture, nothing ever fell into the black hole. It just collected nearer and nearer to the horizon and then evaporated from the horizon. From the other point of view, puzzling. So this tension between the two ways of seeing the world was really deeper than was thought to be. It was not just a curiosity. Part of the puzzle of the information paradox is this tension between the inside view and the outside view. 
I presented the inside view, you jumping across the black hole horizon with the encyclopedia, reading it on the way down. As far as you're concerned, you definitely went into the black hole and the information went in too. If you wisely decided not to jump into the black hole and to stay a long way away from the black hole, you would actually never see me cross the event horizon. Why? Because the light from me would have to get to you in order for you to see it, and nothing can escape from the horizon of a black hole. Uh, the light cannot escape from me. So as far as somebody far away from the black hole is concerned, they may think that the information never even went into the black hole to begin with. And the question, part of the dramatic tension, I think is what Lenny is saying, is that it's how to reconcile this inside view with this outside view. You might just think that they all need to tell a completely consistent story with each other, uh, but maybe uh, they only need to tell a consistent story with each other where the observers are able to compare their stories with each other. Should we move to a question and answer session format now? Lenny, do you want to come up and... Uh... Thank you. So thinking back of your question of how do you go from the singularity to the event horizon, that information is released at the ultimate moment the black hole evaporates, basically. I mean, should we use black hole to store secret for a very long time? Is that... <laughs> Um, okay, that's a great question. Should we use, when is the information emitted from a black hole? Actually, almost all of the information emitted from a black hole is emitted while it is still very large. So eventually, the black hole will get uh, small. Uh, as it evaporates, it starts off very cold and big. And big means cold for black holes, because the formula that Lenny wrote down was that the temperature is equal to h bar divided by the radius. So when it's big, it's cold, evaporates really slowly. Then as it emits energy, the radius goes down and the temperature goes up, and it, it actually emits energy faster and faster and faster. So there's a runaway process in which it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and emits more and more radiation. But you can use the formula that Lenny wrote down to tell you when most of the information is emitted. And most of the information is emitted early, as in is emitted while the black hole is still big because the entropy of the black hole is given by its radius squared, and that's tracking how much information is left in the black hole and how much has already been emitted. So between the time when the black hole is maximum size and half the radius that it was, it's already emitted about three quarters of the information that will ever emit. Um, so is there any uh, measurement or any way whatsoever to figure out at any point that you're inside a black hole? Uh, so you, you said that it wasn't clear as you crossed the boundary, but like, could we know whether or not we are all hurtling towards some ginormous black hole right now? Like everything we know is inside some. Okay, cool. Well, um, if the black hole is big enough, you can sense that you're falling toward an object by measuring tidal forces. What are tidal forces? They're the forces which distort you. Uh, and even if you're in free fall, even if you're in free fall, because the gravitational field is uniform, it's pointing toward the center, there are forces on you which will tend to elongate you and stretch you along the, uh, the vertical direction and tend to compress you along the horizontal direction. Those are forces are feelable. You can, uh, you can sense them. But they're very, very weak if the black hole is big enough. So in principle, with sufficiently good detectors, force detectors, accelerometers, or whatever it is, uh, if you suspected that you were falling toward a black hole whose mass you thought you knew, in principle, you could measure that. But um, the effects of these tidal forces would be very, very, very small. That's from the point of view of somebody falling in. One of the things I didn't tell you, I told you that the black hole has a temperature. And that temperature is very, very low. Remember the... Um, uh, if you look at the formula that I wrote down for the temperature, you would discover that the mass of the denominator. So the bigger the mass of the black hole, the lower the temperature. If you took a solar mass black hole, the temperature, I think, would be about 10 to the minus 8. Uh, yeah. And don't ask me what units. S 60 nanokelvin. 60 nanokelvin. Kelvin. Good. All right. So, so the temperature is very low. You would think that that's extremely benign. On the other hand, the re from another point of view, the reason the temperature is so low is because the photons which are emitted from the horizon lose energy as they propagate outward. For the same reason that if I threw this up in the air, I won't do it, don't worry. If 
but I threw this up in the air. As it travels upward, it loses energy. It loses kinetic energy. Talking about kinetic energy. Just to try to fight its way out of the gravitational field. Same thing is true of the photons that are traveling out of the, uh, out of the, um, the near horizon region. They lose energy, and so for far away, as seen from far away, the temperature of the black hole is small because the energy of the photons is small. But if you track it in toward the horizon, you would say those same photons, when they were emitted from near the horizon, were very, very energetic. And if you do the nominal calculation, you will find out that as you move toward the horizon, the temperature gets bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until when you get right to the horizon, the temperature is uh, almost infinite, just enormously large. Nevertheless, the person who is falling in doesn't seem, it seems that that person does not experience that temperature. Somehow they're immune to it. Who does experience the temperature? And how would you detect that temperature? If you had a thermometer and you lowered it down on a cable, fishing line, lower it down, don't allow it to go through the horizon, and then reel it back in and look at what the temperature registered, you will discover the temperature when it was down there near the horizon was extremely large. But the only way to find that out is by pulling the thermometer back up. If you were to have dropped the thermometer through and fell through with it, watching the thermometer, nothing. So that's the curious, as I said, the, the tension that's there. Do we understand that? Yeah, I think by now we understand it. But, uh, that's for next week. Oh, you have your own. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first is, so with Lenny, we derive the radius of the black hole, right? Um, derive the, the uh, entropy. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. the entropy by starting through and working through all the calculations. Yeah, what I didn't um, mention, incidentally, mm -hmm. I, the, the whole idea that the entropy was proportional to the surface area was itself a surprise. In most contexts, if you ask what's the entropy of this room, it would be proportional to the volume. Right? Because it's just uh, the number of degrees yeah. of freedom in the room is proportional to the volume. So this in itself, just that the entropy was proportional to the surface area, was itself a very big surprise. But okay. Go ahead. Um, and then in Adam's presentation, you uh, mentioned the uh, Schwarzschild radius, which is the radius from the singularity to the event horizon. <laughs> uh, my first question is, is the Schwarzschild radius equivalent to the radius that we were deriving, or is the radius, the, so those two are? The same, or yeah, is that a so they're the same? So, the area is the Schwarzschild radius squared, the okay. area of the event horizon. Asking what the distance is from the event horizon to the singularity turns out to be a slightly tricky question, but it's about the Schwarzschild radius. About okay. Um, and then my second question, um, is about the model that you showed us at the end for the black hole. Um, you told us that it encoded about two pieces of information, right? Um, um, but something that, I mean, I've noticed like in physics in general is that the geometry of a model also encodes information due to being able to use symmetry arguments, et cetera, things like that to tell you things about your system. Um, from your model, it seemed that you had your singularity, you had your event horizon, um, it was circular, and it seemed that um, it symmetrically radiated um, um, Hawking radiation out of the event horizon. Was that a deliberate choice or was that just like an arbitrary selection of the model? So the question was when I wrote down a picture and the uh, Lenny Oscar wrote down a picture of a black hole, we drew it as circular. Mm -hmm. Why, or spherical, sure. as it, as it yeah. should have been, uh, if it was three dimensional. Why spherical? Uh, there tends out to be a very good answer to that question, which is that unless they're spinning, unless they have angular momentum, all black holes are circular. And if they don't start out, uh, sorry, thank you. I get rid of my two-dimensional thinking. They, if they don't start out spherical, they will very rapidly sphericize. Um, uh, and sphericalate. And sphericalate, yeah, and sphericalate. Um, the only exception to that is that they start off spinning, uh, which in fact many astrophysical black holes do start off spinning because they form by uh, two things. Uh, dancing into each other, or they start off with a star that is itself spinning. Um, and even if it was only gently spinning to begin with, by the time it's collapsed down, 
uh, conservation of angular momentum means it'll be spinning quite rapidly. So that's really, for astrophysical black holes, that's typically the only uh, thing that stops them being perfectly spherical. And then they, they bulge out a little bit. But even then, um, that affects none of the arguments uh, that we gave. Uh, everything would just go through just as well uh, with some small changes in the order one factors out front if we considered spinning black holes. Do you know why the Earth is spherical? How come the Earth doesn't look like a potato? Yes, equilibrium. Hmm? Hypostatic equilibrium. Well, <laughs> yes, but it's just gravity. Yeah. If there was a big lump on the Earth, a mountain bigger than, let's say, twice as big as Mount Everest, what would happen to it? It would be flattened by gravity. So it's all this gravity pulling in from every direction that tends to make it spherical, the Earth. It's much more so. It's the same thing except on steroids. The gravitational uh, field of the, of the black hole just very quickly takes any little bulge in it and flattens it out. Not flattens it, and spherical it. <laughs> and doesn't legislate fall the next minimize? Uh, I heard the word minimize, and I think that's the right idea. Actually, sorry, the next question is here in the back. So um, is, is it right to think of gas giants being the seed to a black hole, or the beginning of a black hole being a gas giant? So the question is, how do actual black holes that we actually have in our universe, how do they form? Um, yeah, so I mean, I guess, first of all, from the point of view of what we're saying, how they form doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, but there are two black holes in our actual universe tend to come in two sizes. They're either a few times the mass of the sun, mm -hmm. or they're of order a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. Well, apparently, third is third solar masses. Right. So, so then, the, the ones that we heard with um, the LIGO, with the gravitational wave detection, were 30 solar masses each, two of those slamming into each other. The ones that we saw with the Event Horizon Telescope, well, we saw one, and it was a billion solar masses. It was the one at the center of Andromeda. Um, and those two have, from an astrophysics point of view, have different sources. One forms the small ones, formed by starting off with very large stars, and uh, they undergo gravitational collapse. The sun is not big enough to undergo gravitational collapse. At the end of its life, it'll just peter out. But if it was big enough, of uh, order 30 solar masses will certainly do it, then it would eventually form a black hole. Uh, the ones at the center of the galaxy, it's a little less clear, but it seems to be just a conglomeration of a whole bunch of, whole bunch of stuff. And so when, when we observe jets, is that separate from the radiation in the model? And that information that is being ejected is not recoverable because of the uh, unobservable information <clears throat> unobservable information between the singularity and the event horizon? So the, the question was, uh, when we see jets emerging from astrophysical black holes, is that the same thing as Hawking radiation? And the answer is no. And in fact, the jets that emerge from black astrophysical black holes aren't actually coming from the black hole. They're coming from the uh, stuff that's already outside the black hole. That's That's a classical process, not a quantum process. And it's the part of the magnetic field of the black hole that's already outside the black hole that's emitting some of its energy that way. And there's, a, there's infalling stuff as well. So that's a purely, A, that's a purely classical process. And B, it happens outside the event horizon. It's not energy coming from the black hole itself. Yeah, the jets are not materializing from near the horizon. The jets themselves are stored in gas circulating around the black hole at maybe two, three, four times uh, the uh, uh, Schwarzschild radius. Not from the singularity, but from the Schwarzschild radius itself. So they're well outside. There's no puzzle about where that uh, energy is coming from. Hi, so in the ob observer picture that you mentioned earlier, where somebody's like having already fallen into past the event horizon, I'm curious about how many degrees of freedom of motion there are? Because it seems to me that there's probably only two degrees of freedom of motion. Like, if you imagine like the concentric spheres of like a fixed radius, you can only move along that sphere. And whether that has a relation to why the entropy 
is related, like proportional to the area rather than the volume? I think the answer to the question of why the entropy is proportional to the area goes back to the first picture. The picture as seen from the outside as matter falls in, even the things that built up the black hole in the first place, never as seen from the outside crosses the horizon. It just forms a sediment that keeps getting closer and closer to the horizon. It gets pancaked into, into a thin layer uh, that gets closer and closer to the horizon. That's the classical picture. In the quantum mechanical picture, in addition to getting close to the horizon, it, to the horizon, not to the singularity, it's moving into this region of increasing temperature. And so as it falls in, it heats up. Now, it's not the same as these jets. These jets are formed from well outside the horizon. It heats up as it gets closer and closer to the horizon, and then just radiates its energy back out. So um, remind me, what was the question you asked? Oh, yeah. So from like the um, observer in like already yeah. past the event horizon, how many degrees of freedom of motion would there be? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by degrees of freedom of motion. Um, for that observer or for the whole black hole? Or for for that observer inside it. Like, well, it's just like the usual. Just out. the usual. The observer falling through sees nothing unusual. He says, I can go that way, I can go that way, I can go that way, I can go uh, whatever direction you like. Um, but whatever direction he likes will, to him or her, they will feel pretty much they can move in any direction. But because everything is being swept, because space is being swept in toward the singularity, even if they think they're moving outward, they're not. They're moving inward. Yeah. Thank you. Someone over here. I think you could wait. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, so to the first question, it was mentioned uh, that uh, most of the information is emitted while the black hole is still big. So that means that information is emitted. Does that mean that? And does it mean that it somehow persists at the event horizon? And at the same time, if we can travel inside and read our encyclopedia, it kind of exists inside, you know, closer to the singularity too. And I was wondering if the, what's going on there? Well, indeed, what is going on? So to answer the first half of your question, um, what I should have said if I didn't want to get, uh, if I didn't want to prejudge whether information has escaped from a black hole or not, what I should have said is that almost all of the photons are emitted while the black hole is still large. Everyone would agree on that. If you think that information escapes from a black hole, as is now the developing consensus, then you would say that almost all the information escapes. You get, roughly speaking, one, one bit per photon. Um, but uh, so that will be the exact answer to that, that question. Um, the second question is, it looks like information both makes it out from the black hole and continues into the black hole with the encyclopedia. Uh, isn't that a bit paradoxical? And indeed, that is the information paradox. <laughs> well, I, I was just wondering if there are any possible resolution. Yes. On how it could be resolved. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. That's that's for the next. That's for the next uh, question. Maybe I could ask Lenny, what is black hole complementarity? <laughs> it's just a statement that these two pictures can coexist, and nothing that you will ever do will find a contradiction. But uh, we need another hour to do that. We need another hour. Um, so, how should we do this? Lenny, let, maybe just on that point, let me just ask, you know, the fact that Stephen Hawking posed this question back in 1981 when you and Tuft were, Tuft were there in uh, Werner Erhard's um, villa, I guess, or home or what, whatever he had at that time, uh, and it's gone on this long, even though now we probably realize that Hawking was ultimately wrong in his conclusion, the question obviously created a huge amount of very interesting physics. So maybe just your contemplation on that point, that even asking a question that ultimately, perhaps if someone answers it wrong, still creates a huge amount of interesting physics. Jack said it. Okay, so let me tell you what's going on here. 
What's going on here is that Jack and I and Adam are engaged in a conspiracy. The conspiracy is to make you go out and buy my book. <laughs> Shouldn't have given away 50 copies then. <laughs> no, that's the way you do it. You give away 50 copies in the... Uh, we've whet your appetite, we've caught your curiosity, at least some of you, and um, we have perhaps uh, brought you to the point where you really want to know the answer. The answer is something that took 40 years or more and of extremely subtle ideas, very surprising ideas, very, very surprising ideas. One of the key ideas is called the holographic principle. Roughly speaking, what it says, rough, very roughly speaking, is uh, that the horizon of a black hole is kind of like a hologram. A hologram is a two-dimensional piece of film. It encodes information of three-dimensional uh, um, uh, character. You can reconstruct from the two-dimensional film, you can, can reconstruct full three-dimensional, let's call it reality. Roughly speaking, the horizon of the black hole is a two-dimensional membrane which is functioning as a kind of hologram describing the three-dimensional reality inside the black hole. So it's not a completely, totally, completely new kind of idea. Uh, it's much more quantum mechanical than a hologram, but this idea, which was a sort of wild um, speculation when it first came out, the idea that, uh, that the information of a full three-dimensional world, a quantum world, and the full three-dimensional world could be encoded in a two-dimensional membrane, like a hologram, was, well, initially the idea was due to myself and Gerard Tuft in uh, Holland, uh, we were both known as pretty good physicists, and most people said, oh, these people have lost their marbles. <laughs> it took a couple of years. Primarily, the thing which, uh, which really nailed it in place was work of the physicist Maldacena, Juan Maldacena, who found an extremely precise and concrete version of the holographic principle in which mathematically extremely precise, but what it did say is that the information in any region of space is encoded in a number of degrees of freedom that correspond to a film on the, on the film on the boundary of the system. The mathematics of that is subtle, it's um, very interesting. It is not something that I could not explain to you, but it's not something I can explain to you in 10 minutes. So, um, uh, one answer is to read my book. <laughs> the other is come and ask me. Uh, the third answer is we could do this again and proceed uh, toward a conclusion in a series of steps. But it's not something that's terribly simple. Good. Well, on that note, Jack wants me to tell stories about it, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I we'll have we'll have more sessions of this. Yeah. On that note, please help me thank both Adam and Lenny for a wonderful session tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. And for those who were not lucky enough to get the book, yes, please do get a copy of the book. Page 22 is the story that we're referring to, so <laughs> check it out.